anyway. Uh, good. Well, I, I, I vaguely introduced you, but I don't think that's fully necessary, as uh, everyone knows, Roland is uh, in the data analytics group at NERSC and um, yeah, and uh, led a lot of uh, the Python development uh, at NERSC, putting it on the quality footing it is now. And now uh, him and Laurie and others have uh, are taking it to a next level uh, with uh, advanced Python monitoring. And so, um, yeah, this is going to be a talk at SciPy. And um, he's kindly giving us a preview. Okay. <laughs> All right. Take it away, Roland. So I'll go ahead. So first off, let me provide a little bit of context to everybody. So yeah, as Wahid mentioned, this is a, a talk that I'm going to be giving tomorrow at SciPy. It's a 25 minute talk and there's supposed to be five minutes for questions at the end. And uh, so this is a practice and I'm trying to get the time right. So if there's questions, unless there's like some emergency question or something like that, um, maybe hold it till the end. And um, since we'll have lots of extra time, we could go into extra background material um, if people are interested in hearing about that. So um, with your indulgence, I'm gonna go ahead and give this just like I'm gonna give it tomorrow. So, all right, so I've started my timer here. All right, so hi, I'm Rollin Thomas. I'm from the Data and Analytics Services Group at NERSC. And I'm gonna tell you today about the why and how of our monitoring of scientific Python usage on our supercomputers. And I'm gonna tell you about the framework that we've put together to analyze the data that we collect, uh, also using Python, and share with you some of the more interesting results that we've gathered over the past year of, of monitoring. Uh, I mentioned that I'm from NERSC. NERSC is the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. It's located at Berkeley Lab in Berkeley, California. NERSC is the primary scientific computing facility for the US Department of Energy's Office of Science, which in turn is the largest federal sponsor of basic uh, research in the physical sciences in the United States. Our responsibility is to provide high performance computing, storage, uh, consulting help, training, and much more to more than 8,000 researchers funded by the office's six different program areas. To do this, we operate supercomputers, uh, some of the largest and most powerful systems, fastest systems on the planet. We have two supercomputers on the floor right now at NERSC. Uh, the older one is Cori. It's been running in operation for about six years now. And Perlmutter is the new system, which is getting ready for its first users and is number five on the top 500 list. Uh, since Cori is the production system, that's where all the monitoring of Python that I'm going to be talking about was done. So that's going to be the focus of the talk today. All right. Um, what are we, why are we trying to gather um, data from user activity in the first place? Well, workload analysis, workload data informs how we uh, deploy and support supercomputers at NERSC. What we want to do is understand what the users are actually doing not from what they say they do, but from the data that their interaction with the system actually generates. Um, surveys of what, what users are doing, what their requirements are, gathering requirements, all of that goes alongside the data collection. Um, but what we find is that the data often gives us a nice way to open conversations with users and to ground the conversations uh, with data. This, this is used in two main ways. Uh, the first one is for procurement planning. We need to understand where users are now in terms of their use of the current system, what kind of things are constraining them, how we can improve on this in the next system that we procure. Um, and also to understand what kind of help users are gonna need in order to be able to transition to use the new systems. We also use uh, workload monitoring to uh, improve support for users. Um, to detect problematic or suboptimal usage and identify that proactively and help users find opportunities to clarify or improve our documentation based on what users appear to be doing or what their understanding seems to be. Retiring underutilized software and services, which is important so that we can focus our support on the most important areas at all times. Watch for trends like emerging tools that are going to need our support and get out ahead of that. And also finally to advocate for our users needs with our vendors, uh, Intel, Cray, Nvidia, so on, uh, software developers or with each other internally when we're acting on users behalf. 
All right, so um, what about scientific Python usage on our supercomputer? Python is the newcomer in high performance computing uh, compared to Fortran, C, and C++. But what we and others have observed is really rapid growth in the use and uh, need for support requests over the past uh, five years in Python uh, to the point that vendors and policymakers are actively curious about it. So program managers at DOE wanna know how people are using Python on our systems. And we wanna know how Python should impact procurement of systems and how we support our users. So we do our, we, the last workload analysis that was done um, was in 2018. And looking at that, we, we seem to be um, missing the full extent of Python use on the system. Um, the focus of, of workload analysis is necessarily, of course, on batch kind of workload, which, which makes a lot of sense. But we were kind of curious about whether or not that might be uh, sufficient to explain the full uh, breadth and depth of Python use on the system. In particular, we're especially interested in what libraries or frameworks are in use by Python users on the system, just saying that 30% of users are using Python is a bit like saying they're using Bash. What are they actually doing with Python? Are they doing things with NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-learn, deep learning, that kind of thing? So trying to figure out where users are in terms of libraries and frameworks in Python is very important. So overall, we wanted to figure out how we could enhance the workload analysis effort um, by gathering more uh, detailed data on Python as part of this project called the Monitoring of Data Services Project or MODS, which is our business intelligence project in, in the DAS group, uh, where we're trying to help represent the data stack and workload analysis and Python monitoring is of course a big part of that. All right, so if we wanna do Python monitoring, what do we actually need to do, want to do? What kind of information do we need to gather? And how are we going to do this? So our goal was to try to monitor any Python 3 that was installed on Cori whether or not that was the Python that's installed by the vendor or by ourselves through a software environment module. We also wanted to capture uh, installations of Python environments done by users using Conda or SPAC or if they build from source or whatever they're doing. We also wanted to make sure that we captured Python use in containers. Um, Shifter is kind of our Docker on HPC. It's the, the runtime that we use for running Docker uh, containers on, on Cori. We wanted to be able to introspect those containers as well. Again, with a focus on trying to understand libraries and frameworks. So it's kind of at a low level. We also wanna capture Python use, not just in batch jobs on the compute nodes. We also wanna capture its use on login nodes, Jupyter nodes, which are not in the batch, uh, in, the, in the batch administered by the, the batch uh, queue system, workflow nodes and other special nodes like GPU and large memory clusters that are attached to Cori as well. We wanna provide users with a way to opt out. Um, if there's a reason for them to opt out, um, they can do that for other monitoring technology that we have installed on the system. And so this should be uh, no different. However, their participation in this effort is really important to us and it helps us help them. So we really hope that um, they'll continue to opt in. And that's part of why we're, we're talking about this in this venue. Um, also, it's much harder to op have users agree to opt in than it is to just turn it on and have them opt out. Um, and finally, one of the things we don't wanna do is cause hardships for ourselves or for users. So we need to make sure that we follow our standard operating procedures and testing of the software and make sure that everything just kind of goes right in with all the other software that we install in the system. But also we don't wanna mess up user workflows. Um, that's very important. Um, and it's kind of easy, it's better to miss some data than, uh, than crash a bunch of user jobs. Um, the paper uh, that, that goes with this talk includes a lot of background on related work and other possible approaches. Uh, people with an HPC background might be wondering why we don't just use um, Alt-D or Exalt. Um, we go into that in a little bit. Um, the, the, the approach that we use is similar to what Exalt has in a kind of semi-documented way, but it doesn't seem to be fully supported yet. Um, but there are uh, other reasons that prevent us from, from going with the Exalt solution. But in the future, we might figure out how to integrate with that. Um, so the, really the first group that we found doing this um, outside, of those other, um, outside of those other possible solutions was done on Blue Waters by our, our friend and colleague, Colin McLean, who's actually now at, at Berkeley Lab. And he was 
uh, managing BW Pi, which is the uh, Blue Waters installation of Python on Blue Waters. And um, he presented his uh, metrics uh, at the Cray user group meeting about four years ago, and it was the inspiration for what we do here. So the basic idea is to instrument the Python installation. Of course, they have a Python installation that they provide for users, and so they're mostly in interested in um, instrumenting that. The technique is to use something called sitecustomize.py, which is a part of the um, Python standard library. It runs at normal startup anytime you invoke the Python, uh, the Python binary. Uh, within that, you register an exit handler that runs on normal shutdown. That handler reads sys modules, which is the dictionary that keeps track of everything that's been imported up to that point. And uh, at Blue Waters, they serialize this to disk. All of the stuff that were, was used here is just standard Python library. There's no additional dependencies that need to be added in. So it's very convenient. Um, this has a number of nice features, but maybe also some, some things that we want to do differently in our deployment. Um, first is you need to figure out how to get that site customized into user syspath. That's fairly easy at Blue Waters. You just kind of install it into the BWPy site packages directory. Um, in terms of opting out, resetting Python paths seems like a good way to go, and that's what, that's what we do. Um, you might lose import information in certain situations. And in fact, some of these situations could lead to bias. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later on. But again, we think it's much more important not to interfere too much with user workflows. And it's better just to lose data than to crash jobs. Um, we can actually use this technique um, to, uh, to instrument shifter containers by mounting in uh, the libraries that we need at runtime. Um, we want to make sure that we install the libraries local to the node to avoid um, trying to um, kind of clog up the network with um, attempts to access these, uh, these libraries over the network. Um, we need a robust solution for storing the data. Putting them on disk didn't seem like a really great solution um, in our context. And of course, you need to be careful. So testing um, in terms of unit tests, integration tests, making sure that the things are actually working properly on the test system, GERTY, um, all of that's going to be very important for us. All right, so here's how it works in case that, you know, to make things kind of more concrete, what you need to do is get a hold of a Python that you can kind of mess with. Um, here I used a Docker container. You just install something that you want to import and see it show up. Um, and then what you do is you insert um, kind of a, a script or a module at sitecustomize.py um, at the path shown here, just basically anywhere I think in syspath will actually work, but this seems to be the best place. And then inside of that, um, install an exit handler, which is just a function that you write, and it can take arguments and it can, it can see sys modules and things like that. And you register it using this um, at exit register function. And then I have a little print uh, to say that the site customized is actually running. And when you do this and you do something like import SciPy, the first thing you see is hello from site customized because that's running in the site customized. It's actually running at Python startup. And then the import happens and then the exit handler fires and you see hello from the exit handler and you see all the stuff that got imported while we were importing SciPy. And among them, you see the dependencies of SciPy, lots of other stuff um, and, and SciPy itself. All right, so that can be a lot of, a lot of data per invocation of Python, obviously. Um, all right, so that's the basic idea. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And we try to make it um, easy, uh, easy to manage and um, more organized. Um, and so basically there are three things that you need to worry about. First, you need to figure out how to inspect sys modules in the exit handler. You need to gather additional data for context and streaming um, and, and filtering downstream. So you need to know, was this on a compute node? Is this person a member of NERSC staff? Um, were they using a shifter container, that kind of thing? And you inject that at this point and then report all of that stuff um, with the context information to somewhere, some kind of data store. Um, to organize all of this work, we put together a little package uh, called customs because, and it's called that because what it does is it inspects and reports packages that are being imported. Um, we use a set of check objects during the inspection phase using a search list of modules. So we don't just let all of sys modules go through all the time. We have a few dozen modules that we're, in, that we're particularly interested in. And so we check for those. 
um, the reporter object and forwards all the hits and the context data to um, storage. And in order to make sure that we're not missing any kind of emerging interesting packages, um, one in 10,000 Python invocations forwards the entirety of sys modules um, to kind of to kind of figure that out. So that actually happens several times an hour, basically, if you're curious how often that happens. Um, some of the extra context metadata is shown in the little table uh, on the side there. Um, finally, for deployment, um, we build RPMs in order to be able to put these into the system images so they go directly onto the compute nodes and the login nodes. As I mentioned, we don't want to be importing this stuff over the network. Um, we then do an installation on the test system prior to deployment on uh, Cori, coordinated with CSG, and uh, do integration testing and system checkout tests as well. Um, this is, this is a, a table that summarizes kind of the differences and similarities between the Blue Waters Python and Cori Python monitoring. Um, the main ones to mention here are that instead of uh, doing the kind of append only logging that was being done on Blue Waters, uh, we forward everything that we gather to Omni, the operations monitoring and notification infrastructure, um, basically just using syslog um, and forwarding that to the Elasticsearch database there. Um, it supports containers through local volume mount uh, on the compute nodes or on the login node where it's being used. Um, we don't forward all of sys modules all the time, as I mentioned, and we try to track as many installations as possible. So as long as people keep the Python path that we set on the nodes um, in place, then we're going to be able to um, introspect their Python environments when they run Python, right? So that's how we get data um, to the central data collect. What do we do with it once it's there? Um, part of Omni, our Omni includes a Kibana instance, and we use that a lot for visualization, for creating dashboards. And it works fine once you get the hang of the, the query syntax. But we found that we often have deeper questions and that we kind of needed a bit more of a Python-based workflow that we were comfortable with for analyzing the data in more detail. Um, so we. Our requirements for this are based on the kind of natural workflow, which is that we want to be able to interactively explore as much of the data as possible early on. We want to firm up that kind of prototype exploration and turn it into something that we can run in production. And we want to be able to communicate the findings we have to um, stakeholders. And so I mentioned the word interactive exploration. And so people are probably going to assume that Jupyter is a part of this, and it is, but we for this last thing where we want to communicate with stakeholders, sharing a Jupyter notebook with everybody is probably not the best way to go. Um, dashboards are much better. So the solution that we decided to try kind of as an experiment was to see if we could kind of string together the pieces of the Python data ecosystem and see if we could just use that. So we use Jupyter notebooks for interactive exploration of the data. Um, this inside of those notebooks, we use Dask and QDF uh, Kupai, the Rapids ecosystem uh, on the GPU cluster that we have um, to be able to chunk through as much data as we can. Um, there's a package called Paper Mill, which is for parameterizing and executing those notebooks um, in batch. And we submit those as batch jobs periodically using cron. And there's another package that can take Jupyter notebooks and render them as dashboards um, called Voila. And we run that in spin. Um, the Kubernetes rancher setup that we have for auxiliary services. We can do this with a single notebook for each analysis with a little bit of work, and we'll talk about how that worked. Um, and we use a single Docker container for interactive batch and dashboard use in Kubernetes. All these tools are things that our own users can use, so we're kind of sampling our own champagne here. Um, I mentioned that we try to use a single Jupyter notebook to manage all of this. Um, I like this workflow. Other, other colleagues of mine are not so fond of this, but what we do is we use cell metadata tags, which are a feature of Jupyter notebooks to uh, be able to manage execution of individual cells depending on the context. So your notebook kind of turns into this kind of multi-part document where there's an analysis, exploration analysis part at the top which is run on HPC using GPU enabled code for data cleaning reduction, um, trying different models out, and then ultimately writing reduced data to disk. This gets executed interactively uh, by the user. It can be run in batch uh, using Jupyter and PaperMill. The dashboard part, which runs um, on, on spin, 
Uh, Spin doesn't have GPUs, um, so we rely on reduced data there to create the visualizations, but um, you can also run the dashboard uh, testing part interactively. Um, so the kind of downsides that we encounter with this is that managing tags uh, can be a little bit cumbersome. It's easy to forget to apply them or to remove them. And also you tend to generate a little bit of extra boilerplate code in the notebook. So you might end up importing packages in two contexts, which isn't harmful, but um, might look weird. Um, I mentioned paper mill for productionizing notebook runs. Basically, once you have a template notebook in place, you just um, can kind of import it and execute it. And we can use the cell metadata tags to kind of pre-filter out um, the cells that we don't want to run in batch. Um, and then we submit a batch job. All right. The dashboard, um, since uh, demos are kind of dangerous to do, we put together live demos are a little bit dangerous. We put together a little um, video here to show you. Um, this is a public dash version of the dashboard at mods.nurse.gov. And there are a few different dashboards on the right for Python and Jupyter. And so this is a picture of the quarterly, um, quarterly use Python um, dashboard. So it shows the most popular Python libraries, uh, correlations between Python libraries. I'm going to mention later how much Python usage on different um, parts of the system there was over that quarter and so on. So it's an interactive dashboard. So you can kind of move around and inspect um, different years, different quarters and, and um, things like that. So the, the diagrams that are shown here are a little bit different from the diagrams in the paper because we're kind of continuously trying to improve um, what the dashboard looks like uh, in order to um, especially make sure that it's, it's extremely accessible to everybody. Um, this version here is going to be all of the Python data that we've been collecting over the past uh, year or so. Um, we've actually been collecting data for a bit longer than that, but about a year ago is when we were able to get the full system monitoring into place. So I think that's not the whole video, but I think that's kind of enough to communicate what we're doing with the dashboard. So I'll move on to, um, some results here, if I can, there we go. All right, um, the results I'm gonna show are gonna come from the first five or six months of this year and they exclude staff. So this is just data collected on real users. It turns out that over 30% of users are running jobs that are using Python. This is Python in any form or fashion. Um, the vast majority of jobs that are run using Python are running on the Haswell nodes. It's a little bit easier to get performance in Python uh, on, the, on the Haswell nodes than on KNL. Um, neither of those are that surprising, but uh, on the right-hand side are some results that are a little bit things that we, we didn't anticipate, especially when we turned on the full system monitoring. 95% um, of jobs that run are using a user-provided Python. This is a Python that comes from a Conda environment or from a containerized environment. So what this tells us is that users really like being able to customize their Python experience. Um, at the same time, about 63% of users overall are using the nurse provided module. So um, that, that includes use on login nodes uh, and, and, and the Jupyter nodes as well. But at least in batch, 95% of jobs are using um, user provided Pythons. And one thing, one other thing that we noticed that was a little bit of a surprise was that of all the jobs that could be using the math, Intel math kernel library that are, are using Python, things that are importing NumPy, SciPy, uh, Scikit-Learn, only about 30% of those are using um, MKL. And I think that the reason for that is probably if they're doing a Conda install, they might be pulling in stuff from Conda Forge more often than using the default channels, and that will pull in open flaws. All right. Um, here's the thing that we were mainly interested in was the top tracked library. So these are the top 20 libraries that we were tracking. And our expectations were that SciPy and the Pi data stack are going to be very highly ranked, that we'll see a lot of visualization libraries, things for parallelism, Jupyter, AstroPy, because we have a lot of cosmologists, um, and deep learning will probably rank pretty low because we don't have a lot of hardware that's really optimal for that. But the most surprising thing that we found was the prevalence of the use of multiprocessing. And initially, I'll say I wasn't really that interested in trying to capture multiprocessing use. Um, but Laurie convinced me that we should be watching this. Um, we filtered out in, as much incidental use of multiprocessing as we can um, coming from the Conda or the Mamba installer. 
Um, but what we find from users is that it's a combination of both direct use of multiprocessing and indirect use. And for people who aren't familiar with multiprocessing, it's a real easy way to get kind of process level parallelism, but it doesn't scale beyond, beyond a single node, right? So that's, that's an interesting, we thought that was an interesting data point. <laughs> Um, in terms of the distribution of batch job sizes, most jobs are small, some are large. That is not unique to Python. Most of the workload at NERSC kind of looks like this. At the largest scales, the use of Python is pretty traditional, NumPy and MPI for Pi, which is kind of what you would expect. PyTorch seems to be able to scale uh, bigger than TensorFlow, or at least users find it easier to scale PyTorch, um, or maybe they don't need to scale TensorFlow as big as PyTorch, I'm not sure. Um, Dask, which is another library for uh, parallelism that does scale across multiple nodes, uh, process level parallelism. Uh, most of those are staying below uh, a thousand nodes. So we need to do some work, I think, in order to help users scale, make it easier for users to scale up their Python analyses. And I think that's kind of on us. Um, in terms of um, interesting things you can do with the data, we created a correlation matrix to see what things kind of got imported together. Now there's an obvious problem with this, which is that um, things depend on other things. And it's kind of hard to disentangle dependencies between libraries in order to make this kind of plot. But we did a, a quick and dirty thing, which was just kind of filter out things that looked like kind of obvious um, dependencies between modules above a correlation about 0.9 and just see what was left over. And a few of these are actually um, pretty interesting. So we focused on libraries that in, enable parallelism, um, MPI for Pi, multiprocessing, and Dask. And one of the things we saw was that AstroPy and MPI for Pi happen together a lot. And so this might be an opportunity for the um, AstroPy community and the users of the AstroPy um, uh, package to maybe collaborate um, and develop tooling around uh, improved use of MPI. Also, um, maybe there's opportunities for improving um, performance of AstroPy in terms of um, IO. Multiprocessing seems to be kind of spread over its use is correlated with a whole bunch of other things. It doesn't really seem to have anything that really sticks out too much. There is one dependency, which is that SciPy depends on multiprocessing. Um, we think users like multiprocessing in part because it's easier to port a multiprocessing app between your laptop and, and any other system. And so that's kind of easier than MPI on your laptop. Uh, finally, Dask, and, uh, Dask goes with X-Array and NetCDF. This is um, representing the climate and earth sciences community. Um, some use of Dask appears to be incidental. Some users are not even, uh, when we reach out to them about their Dask use, they, they seem a little bit confused about why we're talking to them. And I think it's because they're, they're not using it for parallelism. They're using some of the, um, uh, some of the auxiliary things that it provides, like uh, maybe reading CSV files or something like that. Um, but what we need to do here, I think, is again, make Dask a bit easier to use. Okay, um, so those are some of the interesting results. Um, and this is, that's gonna bring us to the conclusion of the talk. So the summary is what we've done. Um, we've met our goal to enrich our insight into Python use on Cori. We've created a, a pretty easy framework for inspecting and reporting imports. And we've also um, put it on GitHub in case anybody wants to take a look at it and maybe try to extend it. Um, we've used the data that we've collected to, to actually start new conversations, especially with users and developers. Um, we, pro we put together a prototype to production to publishing kind of pipeline based on Jupyter Notebooks and GPUs and the PyData ecosystem. Um, and we do all of this with a single container on both the HPC side and the Rancher Kubernetes deployment. Um, our future work is going to be applying, is installing monitoring uh, for Python on the Perlmutter sisters system so that we can understand uh, what users, especially of the CPU nodes, are doing and see whether or not there are opportunities to help them migrate to better use the GPU hardware. Um, we're going to also study how users respond to the new system and see what, how their work workloads or their behavior change, try to put together the data with identity and banking information that we have, um, identify points of collaboration with users around, um, oh, I already said that, I should fix that, and um, possibly figure out ways to integrate this kind of monitoring into Xalt, um, which is kind of the, the standard tool used for monitoring. And so there's some links at the bottom, the dashboard and the customs module. And if you're interested in following up with us, you can email us directly there.